Since 2017, when the New York Times ran an expose on a secret Pentagon UFO program, and a weird interstellar thing visited us, UFOs, or UAPs, as they've now been rebranded, are popular once again. Since then, we've made half-hearted attempts to storm Area 51, and we've practically frothed at the mouths in anticipation of a declassified UFO report that revealed nothing. And it's all happened before. UFO panic followed by pop culture boom, and then long-awaited, long-hyped reports that leave us with more questions than answers. Sometimes these events even leave behind victims whose lives are torn to shreds by the experience. Today we're going to take a deep dive into one such case, a creepy, unsolved and true story of a police officer who chased a UFO for 86 miles and lost everything to a flying saucer named Floyd. It all began at 4.45 a.m. on April 17, 1966, Portage County, Ohio. Manua Police Chief Gerald Bukert was on patrol. 37-year-old Manua Village Chief of Police was a very busy man. In 1960, he was appointed the youngest Chief of Police in Ohio history. In the following years, Bukert was often on call up to 24 hours a day. His son Hari would later recall that when people in the community of Manua would ring the police, the call would go to a phone in his house, which was set up as a makeshift one-man police station. Bukert was driving down Route 44 when he heard the first reports come over his police radio. A woman called Hari Hayes in South Akron had called the police to say that a brightly lit object, as big as a house, was flying over her neighborhood. Summit County had then radioed the Portage County Sheriff's Office to let them know to be on the lookout for lights in the sky headed east towards Portage County. Bukit looked out his car window and to the southeast he could indeed see strange lights in the sky. Bukit rushed home to grab his camera, an inexpensive brownie star mite. He woke up his wife and told her to come outside. She objected but eventually agreed, put on a dressing gown and went outside with her excited husband to see what was going on. It was a clear night and they could see the object glowing in the southeast sky. Bukit said that it looked like two table saucers put together. It emitted a cone of light from its underside. Bukit estimated that it was about 18 to 20 miles southeast of his location. But Bukit wasn't the only credible witness currently watching the object. A priest from Manua's St. Joseph's Church also saw it, and would later approach Bukit to confirm his story. As Gerald and Joan Bukit watched, the object tipped slightly on its side and moved off east. Gerald managed to snap a single grainy picture showing a dark object silhouetted against a darker sky and then it was gone. But this would only be the beginning of a series of events that would classify what would become known as the Portage Incident as one of the most credible and the most strange ever reported. A few hours earlier, Deputy Sheriff Dale F. Spa of the Portage County Sheriff's Office, based in Ravenna, had had a dinner of steak and eggs, taken a nap, drank some coffee, and started his shift around midnight. A 34-year-old ex-Air Force veteran who specialized in mid-air refueling, Spa had a reputation as a dependable man with a good sense of humor who liked to drive fast. He was a pretty average guy, and his only distinguishing feature was his height. He was 6 foot 7. He was happily married with two children. Spa picked up Wilbur Barney Neff, a mechanic who occasionally served as a mounted deputy, and the two men went about their shift. For the most part, it was a pretty boring few hours. Nothing of serious note happened except for a minor traffic accident that took place in the early hours when a car had sheared a utility pole near the township of Atwater. While talking to the Ohio Edison technician who'd arrived to carry out repairs, their radios crackled. 20 miles away, Gerald F. Bukert was listening to the same report. However, unlike Bukert, Spar and Neff didn't take this report very seriously. They cracked a few jokes before saying goodbye to the repairman, hopping in their car and driving east down Route 224 to fill out an accident report at the hospital. En route, they stopped at a road between the towns of Atwater and Randolph, about 20 miles away from where Chief Bukit was currently snapping a photo. There was an abandoned car at the side of the road. The car had a strange symbol on the side, a triangle with a lightning bolt through it, and the words, Seven Steps to Hell, printed below. They pulled up behind the car, assuming that it had been involved in an accident or perhaps belonged to the victim of a suicide, someone who'd gotten a little carbon monoxide. As Spa later put it, both men exited their car. There didn't seem to be anyone nearby, 
so the two officers took a look through the windows. Inside was a strange assortment of tech. As far as Spa could tell, it looked to be assorted radio equipment and walkie-talkies. Before Spa and Neff could learn anything further about the contents of the strange vehicle, a much greater mystery would emerge. Suddenly, Spa heard a weird metallic humming. He turned to look and saw a large glowing object rise from behind the tree line to a height of 100 feet and slowly glide towards them. Its top half was dome-shaped, except for a sharp drop-off on one side. According to Spa, something he described as antenna-like protruded from this concave area, although in a later artist's impression it appears more fin-like. The rounded undercarriage was glowing like a mercury vapor light and emitting a cone-shaped beam of light that turned the ground beneath it as bright as day. An interesting fact considering the sighting took place at 5am and the sun didn't rise until just before 6am. Spa described its texture as silver metallic like an aluminum that hasn't been polished. It slowly hovered over them and stopped with the beam shining directly on them. Spa described it as so bright, he had to look down at his hands and clothes just to make sure that he wasn't on fire. Spa estimated the craft had a diameter of up to 40 to 50 feet, although he admits that the brightness of the light made it difficult to estimate its size. When pushed, he said it was 18 feet thick, from the bottom of the light to the rounded antenna slash fin on the top. A frantic exchange took place between Spa and the Ravenna radio dispatcher, Robert Wilson, the same dispatcher Chief Bukit had heard back in Manua. Spa told Wilson that he and Neff had a visual on the bright object that was getting reported. Wilson came back telling him to shoot it down, arguing that nobody would believe it without proof. Duty Sergeant Henry Schoenfeld, also based out of nearby Ravenna, jumped on the radio himself to reverse the shoot order, pointing out that they could be shooting down a government weather balloon for all they know. He asked them to take a photo instead, but unfortunately, there was no camera in their car. While Spa had been speaking on the radio, the object moved to the north side of the road. The humming noise changed pitch. Spa described it as musical, like a pitch pipe, changing to a higher pitch that remained steady and never changed again. It waited there momentarily, then crossed back to the same spot it had been in before. The duty sergeant ordered them to follow the object and determine what it was until they could get some other units in the area with photographic equipment. It then increased in altitude and moved about 250 to 300 feet east of their car and stopped again. Spa later said that he felt compelled to go with it, to chase it. At this point, the object suddenly started moving east again and the policemen followed. Sergeant Schoenfeld advised to follow the vehicle to pursue it or keep it under surveillance as long as possible until I could get some cars or some camera equipment or a photographer out there to take a photograph and if at all possible try to identify it. The vehicle made no attempt to run from us or to escape from us. It give you a feeling of it was watching you watch it, you know? They trailed it due east on 224 for a while before they had to take a south turn on 183 for a short distance. The UFO was immediately to their left. It hesitated when they made the turn as if it was waiting for them. Dale sped after it and it almost seemed to match his speed, accelerating when he did and always keeping a distance of 500 yards between itself and its pursuers. It maintained course for just under a mile and went skimming across Berlin Reservoir. By this point it was travelling at 83 miles per hour and had increased to an altitude of about 1000 feet. After crossing the county line, the object moved back to the north side of 224 and continued east, making no effort to escape its pursuers through the town of Deerfield. It gained altitude at Canfield, but stayed close to the side of the highway. When the pursuing cops had a bit of trouble keeping up due to intersections and traffic, the object would stop and appear to wait for them, before turning sharply south towards Salem. The Ravenna dispatcher called Salem PD to let them know they had a man in high-speed pursuit of an unknown flying object and would like some officers of a camera to come intercept. However, due to confusion, Ravenna had told Salem that their officers had turned south onto Road 14A back at Deerfield, whereas in reality, they likely came down Route 11, southeast toward Columbiana. In Salem, two officers of Salem PD, named Lonnie Johnson and Ray Easterly, rushed out to their patrol cars and drove to a nearby hill. Because of the logistics mess up between Portage and Salem, they were expecting the pursuit to come from the northeast. Instead, they saw a bright object in the sky that was glowing and moving due east towards Columbiana County, and three military jets in pursuit coming in from the north at an altitude of about 10,000 to 20,000 feet. Johnson was also ex-Air Force and had some flying experience. He noted that the jets were clearly discernible and had contrails, but the brightly lit UFO had no visible exhaust plume and was about five times larger than the jets. 
Moments later, at 5.30am, Salem radio operator Jack E. Kramer and Police Lieutenant Richard M. Winnery reported hearing a voice on their radios that was much louder than the usual traffic. It said, I'm going down to take a look at it. I'm right above it, and it's about 45 feet across. Something's trailing behind it, like a ball of fire. The voice didn't identify itself and came on only this one time. Meanwhile, Dale Spa and Barney Neff were still in pursuit. The craft descended again over Unity, with Spa noting that this time it was like it just went down so he could look things over, although it's also possible that the descent was to lose the jets that were now trailing it. East Palestine patrolman Wade in Houston had been monitoring the chatter between Ravenna and Salem and took it upon his own initiative to join the chase. When he heard Dale Spower check in at Firestone Farms, just outside Columbiana, Houston drove to Unity, parked his car, and waited. He was standing beside his cruiser, OV-1, when he heard Dale Spar on his radio. A few minutes later, the object came down onto Route 14 and passed straight above him, at an altitude of about 1,000 feet. Houston described it as a partly melted ice cream cone on top, trailing a cone-shaped beam of light beneath. P-13 passed him with its lights flashing going at 103 miles per hour. Houston jumped in his car and followed. Eventually, they were bumper to bumper, with both men swapping descriptions and commentary on the object via radio as they crossed the state line into Darlington Township, and Route 14 became Route 51. It was 5.35 a.m. Meanwhile, Ravenna radio dispatcher Robert Wilson spoke to the Columbiana County dispatcher and learned that P-13 had left the state. They relayed an order for Spa to break off pursuit and return to station, but Spa was out of range. He was now moving past Darlington, Pennsylvania. Houston radioed ahead to Chippewa State Patrol, but the dispatcher didn't have any available cars to send. While the dispatcher was talking on the radio, PG-13 and OV-1 rode by. He looked out his window, but they were traveling so fast they were already gone. They lost track of the craft near the entrance to Brady Run Park. The road here is flanked by steep hills on either side. They hit an intersection and had to stop the traffic. They saw the craft ascend over the hills directly east towards Beaver County. It took them a while to negotiate the warrant of roads, cutoffs, bridges and underpasses that lead across the Beaver River towards Rochester. They didn't think it was likely they would ever see it again. But when they crossed under an underpass, they could see it clearly against the sky. It had stopped to wait and ascended back to about 1500 feet. Like a child playing a game, it shot off eastwards once more. They followed it down Route 65. Dispatcher logs note that they reached the town of Freedom at 5.30 a.m. Sunrise. By the time they got to Conway, Pennsylvania, P-13's tires were bald and its engines were spluttering. Dale pulled off Route 14 and into an Atlantic service station where another officer, patrolman Frank Panzanella of Conway Police, was already there, watching and sipping on a cup of coffee. Panzanella would later admit that he wasn't going to say anything. Once he'd established that he wasn't watching an aircraft in trouble, he just pulled up and watched. Dale pulled up next to Panzanella, and Houston swung in behind him a minute or two later. They got out of their cars and asked Panzanella if he'd seen it. He admitted that yeah, he'd seen it. While they watched, the object started to drift southeasterly towards Harmony Township. It had been at 1,000 feet, but after it stopped, it reportedly shot straight up at great speed to over 3,000 feet, where it stopped again. After some prompting by the other officers, Panzanella got on his radio and asked him to notify a nearby Pittsburgh airport of a possible mid-air collision in their airspace. John Behe, radio operator at Rochester, answered. Thinking that he was the victim of some sort of prank, he said, Are you sick? Panzanella said that if he was sick, then he had three other sick officers with him. Behe told Panzanella to wait while he tried to get someone from the airport. Eventually, he managed to get through to William Arkers, a watch duty supervisor at the Greater Pittsburgh Tower. The four men stood at the service station watching the object they had been chasing for 86 miles slowly further recede into the early morning sky. A Boeing 707 passenger plane took off from Pittsburgh Airport and passed 1,000 feet below the object's flight path while the men watched. The object seemed to react to this and rose higher until it was almost the size of a ballpoint pen relative to the moon. It's important to note that all four men saw Venus to the right of the moon, and all three objects, moon, UFO, and Venus, at once. It ascended slowly and took about 10 minutes. All the while, they could see the bright light on its underside. Panzanella then got a call back on his radio from an unknown person advising that two jets were being sent to intercept the UFO. Dale Spa then received a message on his radio relayed from Portage via Lisbon, another station back in Ohio close to the Pennsylvania border, asking him to break off pursuit and return to station. Panzanella gave Dale some gas and the three men said their goodbyes and began to part ways. Dale and Barney got into P-13 and Houston into OV-1 and they drove off. Moments later, dispatcher John Behe called Panzanella back and passed on a number that he'd been given by Greater Pittsburgh. Panzanella chased down Houston and Spar, intercepted them, and led them to Rochester Police Station where they could use a phone. They spoke to an unknown Air Force officer who took the details of their sighting and promised to pass it on to someone at Wright Partisan Air Force Base. 
By 6.30am, the object was completely gone. And so the question still remains, what was it? Was the object a natural phenomenon such as marsh gas? Was it an experimental device being developed by our own or some other country? Could it have been a weather balloon caught in a fast air current? Or was it a vehicle that came to us from a civilization far advanced from our own? Dr. Alan Heidick of the University of Michigan, a scientist who investigates unidentified flying objects, once said that the vast majority of UFO sightings can be explained quite easily. But, as Dr. Heinick said, the fact remains that if only one out of all the thousands of sightings that have been reported turned out to be a vehicle from beyond our world, it would be a development that would change our concept of the universe radically. I watched it through the entire flight. I also followed it for 86 miles. I uh, know that it was a vehicle, and uh, if uh, they want to discount it or rule it out, this is perfectly okay by me. According to Ravenna dispatcher Robert Wilson, when Spa and Neff returned to station, they were both unusually serious. Spa, usually an excellent speaker, stuttered, and his hands shook when he smoked a cigarette. It didn't take long for the story of the chase to spread. Within hours, Spa and Bukit were giving radio interviews and journalists and civilian UFO investigators descended on Ravenna, Mantua and East Palestine in droves. When William Weitzel, an investigator from NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, arrived at Ravenna station at 4.45pm, Spa had only slept for half an hour and was visibly exhausted. John Bukit described what happened next as three days of hell, during which all five officers were continually hounded by the press and endured endless phone calls and knocks at the door. Chief Bukit lost 20 pounds, Houston, who worked two jobs, couldn't get any sleep as his phone rang all night. One day after the chase, Dale Spa received a call from Major Hector Quintanilla based out of nearby Wright Patterson Air Force Base. The call was brief and lasted only two and a half minutes. It began with the Major saying, So, tell me about this mirage you saw. According to Spa, Quintanilla tried to convince him that he'd only seen the object for a few minutes. When Spa disagreed, Quint got annoyed and ended the call. Could you tell us to what extent you have been in contact with the federal government's uh, UFO agency? Well, the only contact I've had with the government agency right at this time is uh, I uh, talked to a major. He wanted me to identify the object very briefly for them. I did. He seems to be more interested in obtaining the negative of the photographs that Chief Booker made that night. He uh, doesn't seem to... Uh, be interested in what I have to say at all. When Spa told him about Bukit's photo, he said something to the effect of, I want possession of the negative. Quintanilla then called Chief Bukit and told him not to share the negative with the press and instead to send them directly to him at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. That night, Spa had dinner with William Weitzel, and Weitzel noted that Spa had taken to calling the UFO Floyd after his own middle name. On April 21st, Quintanilla made a second call to Spa, this one about a minute and a half long. He tried again to get Spa to change his story and to say he'd only seen the object for a few minutes. After a brief investigation lasting only a week, Major Quintanilla issued a press conference on April 22nd, stating that it was the Air Force's opinion that the four officers had either been chasing the planet Venus or a satellite, or both. Bukit's photo, according to the Air Force, showed the planet Venus with some processing defects in the film. The press immediately ran the story that the four officers had been chasing the planet Venus, and ridicule soon rained down upon Spa, Panzanella, Neff, Houston, and Bukit was in trouble with the mayor. Houston was also facing some serious flat for leaving his precinct unguarded during the chase. Only Neff got off lightly by avoiding all press completely. Quintanella would later remark, This kind of situation is extremely ticklish because you always have a loser. It's a shame it has to be like this, but it's a fact of life. Dale F. Spa would be the one to lose the most, as he was a talker with an eye for detail. He continually talked to the press under the belief that if he put all the information out there, they would leave him alone. In fact, the opposite would happen. Despite the amount of police officers involved in the original incident, the press and investigations focused entirely on Dale Spa. As a result, Dale Spa's credibility, dignity, and mental health were about to be taken away from him for the simple act of seeing something that could not be simply explained. Within months, his life would be in ruins, and this wasn't the first time it had happened. Hundreds of people told Air Force investigators they'd seen the saucers with their own eyes. Bright, shiny things that whish through the air at incredible speeds. Even airline pilots who seldom indulge in fantasy reported sighting them. And Air Force flyers told of chasing them or something all over the sky. The Air Force called them unidentified flying objects, but people went right on calling them saucers and seeing them. There was something in the air.
It's commonly assumed that UFOs first entered the public consciousness on July 8, 1947, with the reported crash at Roswell, New Mexico. In reality, the real event that lit the fire happened two weeks earlier, on June 28, when a businessman and pilot named Kenneth Arnold was flying past Washington's Mount Rainier. He reportedly saw a flash, and then nine Delta-winged UFOs flying in formation past the wing of his plane. Arnold used a map to sketch their flight paths and positions. Once he cross-referenced his position relative to theirs at the time of the sighting, he estimated they had been travelling at 1,700 miles per hour, three times faster than any other plane that currently existed. The credibility of the witness attracted both the press and the Air Force. A journalist misquoted Arnold's description of the UFOs, moving in a saucer-like fashion, and started calling the UFOs Flying Saucers, and the name Flying Saucers was born. Two Air Force investigators who interviewed Arnold said that they believed him, as he seemed an upstanding and intelligent man who was already an accomplished businessman and pilot who stood nothing to gain from lying. Another said that the report was of such character that if he had not seen the object, then he should be writing Buck Rogers fiction. In the weeks and months that followed, reports of flying saucers skyrocketed across America and even the world, culminating in the famous incident, or non-incident, at Roswell. September 23, 1947. The Chief of the Air Technical Intelligence Center, one of the Air Force's most highly specialized intelligence units, sent a letter to the Commanding General of the then Army Air Forces stating that they had conducted a preliminary study of UFO reports and concluded that the phenomenon was real. They weren't sure, however, whether the phenomenon was extraterrestrial or Soviet. A task force was quickly set up to investigate. It was given the nickname Project Sign. Project Sign produced a top secret document titled the estimate of the situation that reportedly proved that UFOs were interplanetary. However, the extraterrestrial hypothesis was shot down by Air Force brass. According to Edward J. Ruppelt, it was a time of near hysterical panic. By early 1949, Project Sign had changed tactics. Instead of trying to prove that UFOs were real, they started doing the opposite, assuming that every case they investigated was caused by a balloon or satellite or other commonplace phenomena. These reports garnered a warmer reception from the Pentagon and set in place a trend that would continue for decades to come. On February 11, 1949, Project Sign was renamed Project Grudge, and Grudge moved ahead under a new, unofficial mission statement of getting rid of the UFOs. Ruppelt described this as a two-phase process. The first phase, explain every UFO report. The second, tell the public how the Air Force had solved the sightings. This, they reasoned, would put an end to UFO reports once and for all. To help with the first phase, a 39-year-old astrophysicist from Ohio State Astronomy Department named J. Allen Hynek was hired as a civilian contractor to pour through grudge and science files to rule out any reports that were caused by planets, meteors, or other astrological phenomena. For the second phase, they used a reporter named Sidney Charley. While most other journalists had been brushed off, Charley was skeptical of the phenomenon and would present the information the way that the Air Force wanted it. Sydney's article had the opposite effect, however, and many began to wonder if the Air Force were covering up the truth. This led many reporters and civilians to conduct their own investigations. The Air Force put out a press conference announcing that there was no such thing as UFOs, only misattribution of conventional phenomena or balloons, that Project Grudge was about to close, and its full findings would be released in a few days' time. The Grudge Report was meant to be the final nail in the UFO coffin, but it would only encourage the UFO researchers more, as many saw it as an obvious attempt to put out a fake report full of misleading information to cover up the real story. Also, although the Grudge Report had been ruthless at weeding out as many sightings as possible, there was still that nagging 23% of sightings that couldn't be explained. Donald Kehoe, an ex-Marine Corps naval manager and freelance writer, used his military connections to try and acquire the truth of UFOs. He was denied access and stonewalled, and concluded that there was a government cover-up. After one year's investigation, I believe that the flying saucers, seen by veteran airline and air force pilots, are objects from another planet. And the result was his 1950 article for True Magazine, The Flying Saucers Are Real. The article was hugely popular, and would soon lead to an expanded book by the same name. UFOs were back in fashion again. In 1952, the project would change its name one last time to Project Blue Book. This man is retired Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, U.S. Air Force, and former head of Project Blue Book. Friend now relates this most unusual experience. It was 1959 when I was invited to attend a briefing in the security portion of this building. It seems a retired rear admiral had information about a woman in Upper Maine that purported to have established contact with extraterrestrial beings. Two naval intelligence officers were sent to investigate. The naval officers met with the woman. 
and she went into a trance, supposedly to establish contact with the purported extraterrestrials. And then they asked her scientific and technical questions that a woman in her education could not possibly know the answers to. Yet, as the questions were put to her, she was able to answer easily with seeming telepathic help from these purported extraterrestrials. According to the report, she indicated there was an organization, OEEV, which meant Universal Association of Planets. And that organization had a project, UENZA, meaning Earth, which was being conducted. Then an unexpected turn took place. One of the naval officers was informed by the woman that they, the extraterrestrials, were willing to answer questions directly through him, a naval commander and intelligence officer with no prior experience in telepathic communication. He took over and attempted to write down the answers to questions put to him by his fellow naval officers, such as, do you favor the government, religious group, or race? And would there be a third world war? The answer to both was no. The group then asked if they could see a spaceship. And the commander, still in a trance, told them to go to the window and they would have proof. The group moved to the window where they supposedly observed a UFO. I was told that a call was made for radar confirmation. The reply came back that that particular quadrant of the area was blanked out on radar at the time. After being briefed on all of the details, I asked the commander if he would attempt to contact me. He sat for several minutes and then appeared in a deep trance with his Adam's apple moving up and down rapidly. Questions were put to him and he answered them by printing in rather large letters using rapid but jerky motions. It wasn't at all like his natural hand. During the course of the questioning, we learned the names of some of the so-called extraterrestrials. One was Krill, C-R-L-L-L. -L -L. Another, Alamar, A-L-O-M-A-R. And another, Afa, A-F-F-A, purportedly from the planet Uranus. Project Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book had predicted many times that the UFO phenomena would go away if they simply kept debunking witness accounts. However, UFOs had not only not gone away, but reports had grown more numerous and more strange. Also, the project was leaving behind victims who'd suffered greatly after making their reports, assaulted by overwhelming interest by the media, only to be called idiots and liars by the Air Force. Victims such as Kenneth Arnold, who'd ended up regretting making his report just days later. He reported that he'd like to get on a flying saucer just to escape the negative attention he was receiving. To add to this, the Air Force project had ruled Arnold's sighting a simple mirage caused by snow blowing off Mount Rainier, something the experienced mountain pilot strongly disagreed with. Even years later, he was still bitter that he and others had been betrayed by their own government's handling of their sightings. Right here we've seen something, I've seen something, hundreds of pilots have seen something in the skies. We have dutifully reported these things. And we have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously? Why, this is utterly fantastic. This is more fantastic than, than flying saucers or, or people from Venus or anything. J. Allen Hynek coined the term high strangeness for reports that involved more than a simple nondescript light in the sky. High strangeness reports often included close encounters of the third kind or other bizarre events. Right here is where this uh, flying saucer, this UFO, landed. I was in my kitchen uh, having a bite of lunch, and I looked out the window, and that's when I first saw this thing coming straight down, just like an elevator. I rushed out to see what it was, and by that time, there was a hatchway opening up in the top of it, just like the trunk of your car. And then there, there stood a little man, holding up a jug, and he motioned he wanted to drink. He motioned for water, so I walked up to him, and I looked up, and I handed the jug up with both hands, and I had that same look in his eyes, a sort of a penetrating look. So when he took the water, I balanced myself with this hand against the machine, and I stepped back a few steps. With that, uh, he set the jug down, and he gave me a salute with the back of his hand, a gesture of thanks, I presume. And then, uh, well, I gave him my salute. What am I gonna do? I noticed this little man, the uh, same size of a man, right to the side, the right side of the hatchway, cooking, uh, cooking these pancakes, which I have one here yet. Uh, 
he were he was frying these these pancakes and uh, I pointed to him and made a gesture like eating. I thought maybe I'd get a conversation out of him. Nobody was saying anything. But he uh, he didn't say a word. He just reached over and he got a handful of them, the four of them, and he handed them down to me. And uh, they were hot and greasy. And this uh, man cooking these pancakes, it was on a square uh, grill-like concern. I couldn't see any flame, but it seemed to be very hot. There was smoke coming from it. And uh, if that was their food, God help them, because I took a bite of one of them, and it tasted like a piece of cardboard. And uh, if that's what they lived on, no wonder they're small. And with that, he reached up and he closed his hatch. And uh, with that, the thing started to raise, just like it came down. Everything was time perfect. It went up about 20 feet. It tilted at 45 degrees, straight south, and shot off. And within uh, two or three seconds, it was out of sight. Well, there I stood in the driveway with a handful of greasy pancakes and my mouth open, wondering what the heck I saw, what had happened. It is outside the realm of the Air Force to pass judgment on Mr. Simon King's case. However, the pancakes that he turned over to the Air Force were turned over to the food and drug people, and they were analyzed as pure buckwheat pancakes. In 1963, Major Hector Quintanilla became the latest in a long line of the project's chief officers. Quintanilla was an accomplished man. Born a Mexican immigrant, Quintanilla had achieved a degree in physics and a bright career in the Air Force, which he was very proud of. From the accounts that I could find, he was generally well liked amongst his peers. In a way, he would end up becoming just another victim of the project himself. He would freely admit that he never wanted the job, that he didn't believe in UFOs, and that he thought Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book were a colossal waste of money and time. There are even some reports that state that Quintanilla's assignment to Blue Book was punishment for refusing any posting related to the growing Vietnam conflict. Whatever the case may be, it's clear that Quintanilla's method, during his time as Blue Book chief officer, was to ignore credible UFO sightings unless they had been covered heavily by the press. If this was the case, he simply attached a credible-ish sounding explanation to the case and closed the investigation as fast as possible. During his time studying UFO reports, Hynek had become less skeptical and more interested in a scientific framework to study the phenomena. He invented the term UFO, as well as the close encounter categorizations. He would also work with Jacques Vallée to computerize the data in Blue Book's files so that they could be better studied. Quintanella would summarily turn this proposal down. Hynek, along with the general public, was beginning to suspect that Blue Book was just a front for a secret investigation taking place elsewhere. He was becoming publicly skeptical of Blue Book, and especially of Quintanilla's methods, which he described as simply disregarding any information which didn't suit his hypothesis. Hynek would later say that cases that involved high strangeness and high credibility were rare. Although they were often reported throughout the 50s and 60s, they rarely made it to the desks of Project Blue Book and were likely discarded. Joe Simonton and his greasy pancakes did, but that's likely because poor Joe was an eccentric hermit, not someone credible, like, say, as he got closer, he saw that it was an egg-shaped metallic object with a strange symbol on the side. Did I see it or didn't I, you know? Or what happened, you know? And, uh... ...developed by the military that entirely matched Zamora's description. In fact, he confirmed that no lunar landers in development were available or even capable of what Zamora saw. And he even checked with every company doing... ...insignia observed by Lani Zamora on the side of the craft. The insignia was unidentifiable. Not American, nor Russian. And last of all, the observation of these two people in some sort of suit. It's criticism. March 14th, 1966. The great flying saucer mystery of 1966 began here, near Dexter, Michigan, late in March. Before the month was out, flying saucers were being reported from New Jersey to California, from Colorado to Long Island, from Ohio to Georgia. Invariably, the first reports were brought in by quiet and sober citizens like Frank Manor, father of ten children, a countryman, a hunting man, a man used to wooded swamplands by night. I looked to the north of me, and uh, there were looked like a fallen star. Meter, uh, it was red, and kind of coming down, and on a forty about a forty-five, and so then I watched it, and I was going to see if it landed, and then maybe go down and see what it was. And uh, when it got to the top of the trees, it stopped, and a, a blue and a white light come on it. And uh, I looked at it, and I thought I was seeing things. Frank Manor's UFO remained over his swamp more than four hours. His children saw it, his in-laws saw it, 
Residents of the area saw it. The police saw it. No one photographed it, but Sergeant Newell Schneider of the Sheriff's Office remembered it well enough to draw it. No, it uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or rather any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. Forty miles away, another swampland and another UFO sighting. This is Hillsdale, and the girls at Hillsdale College had a night to remember. Well, when I was looking out the window with binoculars, I guess it was about 12, I saw it, and I saw two red lights, and I saw what looked to be shaped like a pie. I could just see the front of it, and I just saw the round front, and I could see the lights on either side. And then the red light was sort of casting a glow over the whole thing, so it looked like a round disc. At first, when I heard the other girls talk about it, I didn't really... I believed them, yet I couldn't really make myself comprehend it because I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. But then when I saw it, I just was fascinated. I wasn't afraid. I, I just wanted to stay there and keep my eyes glued to it. I couldn't. A wave of UFO sightings took place in Michigan and Ohio, centering on Washtenaw County. Over the course of seven days, hundreds of people would report sightings, including dozens of police officers. The most intense was that of Frank Mana and his son. Quintanella was under huge pressure to explain away the sightings, so he sent Hynek to Michigan, but reluctantly, fearing Hynek's growing fame and the fact that the scientist was becoming more convinced that many of the sightings were real. Three days later, Hynek called a press conference where he said that many of the reported sightings resembled the natural phenomena of swamp gas and the illusion of motion frequently is given by the fact that a little bit of swamp light appears here, it goes out, another one appears over here, that goes out then, and, but the illusion as viewed from a distance is that the objects have moved back and forth. After Hynek's hypothesis hit the headlines, Hynek became a nationwide cultural meme. The public were fed up with the Air Force's ridiculous explanations and many were beginning to clamor for an open scientific investigation. Meanwhile, Frank Manor, caught in the middle, had his house vandalized and his car windows broken. He also received dozens of prank calls throughout the night, calling him the head Martian. Well, you can look at here, look, beer bottles thrown. Look at my windshield. What would you think if somebody was throwing beer bottles at your house, standing out in the middle of the road screaming, uh, you nut, you're fantastic and all that? What would you think? Are you sorry now that you did tell people what you saw? Yes, I am. I am I'm sorry because uh, it, it, not that, that it, it's not the truth, but it's just the idea, the reaction of the people. They think you're a, a nut. Tell you the truth, that's just what they figure you are. And I'm not going to take it no more. I don't want nobody down in here. I, I just leave me alone. And if, it, and if the thing lands right there, and right there by that pump, I'd never say a word. And he got out and talked to me. I wouldn't tell nobody. That's just the way I feel. I'm bitter and, and disgusted in the whole matter. And uh, if, if people's going to act like that, I hope one lands right in Ann Arbor, right in the middle of Detroit. Quintanella was furious that Hynek had fueled the media frenzy instead of debunking the sightings. And in his book, UFOs and Air Force Dilemma, he admits that he was considering firing Hynek from the project shortly afterwards. Hynek would later walk back his swamp gas theory, pointing out that he'd never meant to give a catch-all explanation for every sighting, just that some of the sightings, such as the photo that was taken by a Washtenaw deputy, could potentially be explained as marsh gas. Well, the pressure was mounting for an official explanation. There were more than 60 newsmen jammed in at that news conference. I gave what I thought to be at that time the only scientific explanation possible for the faint lights in the swampy area. I made the statement that it could be swamp gas, and even though I went on to emphasize that I couldn't prove it in a court of law, that that was the full explanation for these sightings. Well, the press picked up the phrase swamp gas and rushed off to the telephones, and I was to come into a great deal of criticism over it. In a sinister twist, Douglas Harvey, the sheriff of Washtenaw, would later say that he saw Hynek take a call from the Air Force where he was ordered to give the swamp gas explanation. Hynek never confirmed this, but he did say that he was under a huge amount of pressure to say something skeptical in order to retain access to Blue Book. After all, if he was too publicly open-minded, he could be easily replaced by a less scrupulous scientist. Public backlash against Project Blue Book had gained momentum, and even current congressman and future president Gerald Ford had begun to publicly chide the Air Force and to push for a congressional hearing featuring a selection of credible witness testimonies. Meanwhile, NICAP, the non-profit UFO research organization, which had been partly set up by, and was now run by, Donald Kehoe, was thriving. Throughout the 1960s, their membership had swelled and swelled. 
and whenever Project Blue Book had closed the case on an interesting report, NICOP had been there to carry out a thorough and detailed investigation in their stead, and to criticise Blue Book to the press. Project Blue Book was at breaking point. Quintanilla couldn't afford for his operation to endure any more negative publicity. April 23rd, 1966. In the aftermath of Quintanilla's statement regarding the Portage sighting, William Weitzel wrote a detailed letter criticizing Quintanilla's investigation. Among others, he sent it to Gerald Ford and Ohio Congressman William Stanton, who in turn contacted the Pentagon, who pressured Quintanilla to take a second look at the Portage case. After a severe beating by the press and NICOP, Quintanilla returned to Portage County on May 10th to conduct interviews with the witnesses. He went to Manoa first to meet with Mr. and Mrs. Bukit, then travelled to Ravenna for an interview with Spa. Unbeknownst to Quintanella, Spa, wary that the Air Force may brush him off again, had asked for Barney Neff to join him. Robert Wilson, the Portage County dispatcher, also came to give his testimony, and Sheriff Dustman also came along to vouch for his two deputies. Spar also asked for William Weitzel to attend as a witness and to record the interview. A local investigator and another member of NICA were also in attendance. When Quintanilla arrived at the Ravenna courthouse and saw what he perceived to be an ambush, the situation was tense. He asked everyone except the three policemen to leave. Throughout the interview, Quintanilla's tone is harsh, and you can hear him sigh audibly multiple times. I don't know exactly how long. I was, uh, I was pretty scared for a couple of minutes. As a matter of fact, I was petrified. And, uh, so I moved my right foot, and I, everything seemed to work hard. Spa and Neff talk about the jets they saw during the chase. Quintanella tells them flatly, there were no jets. So when they started talking about fiber planes, just to go that thing where every word that was said, it went straight up. And I mean, when they put up, they didn't play no games, it was straight up. There were no fiber planes in the sky. <clears throat> there were no fiber planes. We talked to the tower operator at the Great Pittsburgh Airport. When Spa jokes that the jets are perhaps another hallucination, oh, I had another hallucination. <laughs> and explains how what he and the other officers saw couldn't possibly be Venus, Quintanilla scolds him, saying he doesn't call anyone a nut, and tells Spa to treat him with respect. I'm with the same respect for that treatment. I would, sir, and I am. I'll treat you really bad. I'm not saying you have hallucinations. All right, for the last 20 days. Anyway. All in all, it was a pretty unproductive and unhelpful meeting, where Quintanilla clearly isn't happy and clearly doesn't want to be there. His refusal to even consider Spa and Neff's version of events is tantamount to gaslighting. Spa, meanwhile, sounds exhausted. We watched it. Four men watched it, watched the plane go underneath heaven and watched the make a vertical climb straight up. And this, sir, is my knowledge of God's truth. Yes, sir. The only thing left to even look at is the one bright spot that was there, the sun was up, coming up full, and the moon was fading out. It was about a quarter of the moon, and right straight off that moon, which would have been on the south of the moon if we were looking west, was one bright spot. I would say it was probably a pencil race, a real bright. That was the mother ship. Huh? That was the mother ship. Oh, that was the mother ship. <laughs> and this, we have no idea who that was. I need to some tampons in the car. <laughs> At one point, he admits to Quintanilla that he started calling the UFO Floyd. Well, this one has been identified because since then, and since I know what this one looks like, I gave it the name of a Floyd, see? So that's Floyd now. That's another satellite. What's more, according to Spa, he'd seen it again, one more time, two weeks after the original sighting. The meeting ended with another short confrontation, this time between William Weitzel and Quintanilla. The meeting ends shortly afterwards. Weitzel sat down with Spa and Neff to discuss how the interview went. Spa mentions that it hurt his feelings to be told that what he saw was not what he'd seen. As Quintanella returned home, he admitted that he was troubled by what appeared to be happening to Dale Spa's mental state. However, he didn't accept any blame for his part in this, and instead blamed NICAP and the media for using Dale Spa and dragging out the story. He called the Pentagon and told them that he wouldn't change his evaluation. Even though he admitted that there were major inconsistencies, he told the Pentagon that there was no new evidence and that his original evaluation that officers Dale Spa, Barney Neff, Wayne Houston, and Frank Panzanella had all chased a satellite, or the planet Venus, for 86 miles. At no point did Hector Quintanilla consult with Alan Hynek, Project Blue Book's chief astronomer, in making his original evaluation, or his re-evaluation on May 10th. In fact, Hynek would later say that the whole thing was an embarrassment to him personally. As the project's chief astronomer, he was supposed to be consulted, but admits this was rarely the case. <laughs> that early 
feet. Carpet. Yeah. Rug. I hear you talking, Daddy. Yeah. Then... In the twisted world of loneliness and twisted nightmares, Dale Spower wonders if the chase will ever end. It began six months ago with seven steps to hell and a flying saucer named Floyd. In the pre-dawn hours of a gentle April morning, Sour chased the flying saucer 86 miles. And now the strange evil craft is chasing him. And he is hiding from it, a bearded stranger peering past the limp curtains of a tiny motel room in Solon, Ohio. He no longer is a deputy sheriff. His marriage is shattered. He has lost 40 pounds. He lives on one bowl of Wheaties and a sandwich each day. Four other officers took part in the sinister April drama. Police Chief Gerald Bukert of Mantua, Ohio, saw the craft. He photographed it. The pictures turned out badly, an odd fuzzy white thing suspended in blackness. Today, Chief Bukert laughs nervously when he speaks of that night. <laughs> I, I, I just read and I thought about it. It's something that I should be forgotten, should be left alone. I saw something, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> Special Deputy W.L. Neff rode with Spower during the chase. He won't talk about it. His wife, Jacqueline, explains, I hope I never see him like he was after the chase. He was real white, almost in a state of shock. It was awful. And people made fun of him afterwards. He never talks about it anymore. Once he told me if that thing landed in my backyard, I wouldn't tell a soul. He's been through a ringer. Patrolman Frank Panizella saw the chase end in Conway, Pennsylvania, where he works. He saw the craft, too. Now he is silent. Friends say that he had his telephone removed because of calls about that evil April morning. H. Wayne Houston was a police officer in East Palestine, Ohio. He had worked there seven years. Several months after the saucer passed above him in the night, he resigned going to Seattle, Washington, and is now driving a bus. Houston now goes by Harold W. Houston. He tells you, sure, I quit because of that thing. People laugh at me, and there was pressure. You couldn't put your finger on it, but the pressure was there. The city officials didn't like police officers chasing flying saucers. That's the story of the other officers. Three of them still wear badges, but do not speak of what they saw. Spower and Houston have turned in their badges. And now, this very minute, Dale Spower hides in Solon, a fugitive from a flying saucer named Floyd. He cannot escape the strange craft. It remains with him, locked in his mind, reappearing in nightly sweating dreams that are a bizarre mixture of reality and fantasy. But that night, he is driving car number 13. My entire life came crashing down around my shoulders. Everything changed. I still don't really know what happened, but suddenly it was as though everybody owned me and I no longer had anything for myself, my wife, my home, my children. They all seemed to fade away and mean nothing. Something happened to Dale, said his wife. I don't know what it was. He come home that day and I never saw him more frightened before. He just acted strange and listless, just sat around and looked pale. Then later he got real nervous. He started to run away. He just disappeared for days and days. I wouldn't see him. Our marriage fell apart. All sorts of people come to the house, investigated reporters. They kept hounding him. They hounded him right into the ground. And he changed. Then one night, Dale came home very late. He isn't sure what happened. He walked into the living room. There were some other people there. Things were very tense, very confused. He grabbed his wife and shook her hard. He kept shaking her. It left big, ugly bruises on her arms. He doesn't know how or why. That was the end of July. Denise filed assault and battery charges. Dale was jailed. He turned in his badge. A newspaper printed a story about the deputy who chased the flying saucer, being jailed for beating his wife. And when he got out of jail, Dale left town, turned his back on everything. But the saucers followed him, locked in his dreams. In Ravenna, Ohio, Denise, his ex-wife, can only say, Dale is a lost soul. Everything is finished for us. In Solon, Dale said, I've become a freak. I'm so damn lonely. Look at me, 34 years old, and what do I have? Nothing. Who knows me? Everyone, I'm Dale Spower, the nut who chased a flying saucer. My father called me several weeks ago. A long time ago, we had a fight. I hadn't heard him from him for years. And then he calls me after years. Do you think he called to ask me how I was, to say I love you, son, to see if I wanted to go fishing or something? Hell no. He wanted to know if I'd seen more flying saucers. I tried to go to church for help. I went to church, and the minister introduced me to the congregation. He said, we have the man here who chased a flying saucer with us today. And I got up and left. 
Dale Spower wept as he told what the flying saucer named Floyd has done to him. He calls it Floyd because he saw it once more while he was still working for the sheriff's department. The radio operators knew civilians were monitoring their broadcast, so they agreed to use a code name if the flying saucer was seen again. They called it Floyd. Dale Spower's middle name. Dale was driving east on Interstate 80S one night in June. He looked up. There it was. Floyd's here with me. He whispered into the car radio. Then he parked the car and sat there, alone. This time, Barney Neff was not with him. Dale did not look out of the window. He just stared at the floor of the cruiser, sat there for nearly 15 minutes, not looking outside, not wanting to see Floyd. When he looked up, Floyd had disappeared. Yet it follows him and has ruined his life. This he believed. So, what was it? Quintanilla believed that Venus was the most likely explanation. However, the police, NICOP, and Blue Book's chief astronomer all disagreed. As Sheriff Dustman put it, Venus doesn't go up and down, and it doesn't go side to side. We can also discount balloons. Project Blue Book's files show that they checked extensively for balloons, and there were no known balloons in the area. Also, the wind conditions wouldn't have carried any balloon at the speed that Floyd was reported to move. On October 15, 1966, the Ravenna Record Courier ran a story claiming that the Portage County chase was the result of a prank by four physics students from Kent University. But, the strangeness of this case defies such a neat little explanation. Despite being absolutely the most logical explanation, the balloon slash prank theory is the easiest to disprove, and the one thing that both factions, NICOP and Blue Book, agree on. Quintanilla had completely ruled out balloons as a cause as soon as he'd received the sightings, and NICOP hadn't even bothered to consider balloons as an explanation. The wind wasn't blowing hard enough, or in the right direction, and it's unlikely that a balloon, like the one described in the article, could have moved at 100 miles per hour and performed complex maneuvers, and fooled four policemen, an astronomer, and a man whose whole job was to debunk UFO reports, at any cost. It's also highly unlikely that a battery-powered torch would have shined so brightly that a qualified observer thought he was going to burst into flames. The alleged hoaxes never came forward themselves, if they ever existed, and nobody involved ever spoke publicly on the matter. If there was any possibility that the hoax story was true, Quintanilla would have embraced it. However, even he stayed away. But at this point it no longer mattered because the media had moved away from the saucer story, the prank story, the Venus slash satellite story, and the Blue Book investigation, and was instead covering Dale Spa's breakdown with grim, sadistic glee. Speaking of which, what about a psychological explanation? Dale Spa's mental decline could indicate a psychological explanation, but it would also mean that it was a mass shared delusion due to the number of witnesses, and also, what are the chances that all involved were having the same delusion at the same time? Carl Jung has written extensively on the psychological aspect of UFOs. I'm way too dumb to give you a detailed breakdown of his theories, but put simply, he believed that the dreamlike imagery and themes associated with reported sightings put them more in line with historical sightings of the Virgin Mary in the sky driven by a need to experience something transcendent, and shaped by cultural expectations. A good theory, but it still doesn't explain the multiple witnesses in the Ravenna case or the photo. Okay, so let's just get it out of the way. Aliens. You may be surprised to hear me say this, but there's actually no evidence whatsoever that Floyd was extraterrestrial. No physical evidence has ever been found, nobody witnessed any aliens, and most damning of all, Floyd didn't act like an alien. Why would an intelligent species dedicate the vast time and resources to traveling the impossibly vast distances between galaxies just to play tag with four police officers? If their purpose was to study, then why appear when study could be done from a distance with technology? Why lead police officers on a dangerous chase? And why return to frighten Dale Spa into a mental breakdown? Whatever Floyd was, it didn't act like an intelligent, presumably logical extraterrestrial being. It acted playfully, at first, and later, when it returned to haunt Dale Spa, it seemed to demonstrate malice. And what about the car that Dale Spar and Barney Neff saw just before the sighting? This, at least, is one mystery we can't solve. According to William Weitzel, the car was later found to contain nothing more mysterious than empty beer bottles and old country music tapes. I found this archived site which claims that the symbol and the Seven Steps to Hell motto relates to a military intelligence unit that may have been operating in the area at the time, perhaps tracking Floyd as the author suggests. However, that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down, this video is already embarrassingly long. Which brings us to the last crumb of high strangeness. An enigmatic, self-proclaimed psychic named Ted Owens who also went by the name P.K. Man. On June 21st, Ted Owens sent a letter to George Clark of the CIA claiming that some policemen had recently fired their guns at a flying saucer. He said that the men had kept this fact a secret and that the aliens would eliminate the next police officer to do so. He later confirmed he was talking about the Portage case. 
Owens had been accurate enough in his past predictions of upcoming UFO reports that he'd garnered some attention. However, he made some pretty insane claims, like being in direct contact with aliens who he called SIs, or saucer intelligences. He was also a kook who wrote letters to baseball teams telling them that he'd have the aliens make them lose unless they paid him. So, the letter was ignored. After John DeGroote's article, he claimed that the aliens had eliminated Dill Spa, and that the symbol in the car, which he pointed out was similar to the symbol he signed his letters with, and the seven steps to hell motto, was a warning about a coming catastrophe. The great UFO flop of 1966 led directly to the formation of the Condon Committee. Initially promised as a bipartisan scientific study of the phenomena, it soon collapsed into irrelevance and absurdity. Although initially promised to be completely impartial, Edward Condon soon revealed that he thought the whole subject was nonsense, and he had only wanted to chair the committee so that he could acquire the prestige of debunking UFOs. Hynek was barred from giving detailed testimony by the Air Force, and most of the interesting UFO cases were ignored in favour of kooky experiences, making bold and sometimes insane claims about alien contact. William Weitzel made sure that Edward Condon received a copy of his detailed investigation of the Ravenna case, and was promised it would be examined. However, it was completely ignored. The committee was considered a complete debacle by everyone involved. It eventually concluded that UFOs likely aren't extraterrestrial and don't appear to pose a threat. Quintanilla made good on his promise to fire Hynek after Ravenna and made sure his contract was no longer renewed, not that it mattered. Blue Book collapsed soon afterwards, having become more of a PR liability than anything else. NICAP also disintegrated, although its spirit lives on in groups such as MUFON and SUFON, which was founded by Hynek himself. In 1972, Hynek wrote The UFO Experience, A Scientific Inquiry. In it, he discussed the Ravenna case extensively, citing the incident as a perfect example of the ludicrous way Blue Book investigated their cases, and almost going as far as to state that Blue Book's ineptitude was tantamount to a cover-up. Steven Spielberg read Hynek's book and based his 1972 film Close Encounters of the Third Kind heavily on Hynek's source material. So I met with him, and I used him, and I picked his brain, and, and he consulted with me. He's even in the movie in a snippet of a scene in the third act. And I owe a lot to his instilling in me a professional's point of view on this kind of field reporting. And he helped me make the movie more credible than it would have been without his, his existence. Spa was also allegedly brought in as a consultant, but apparently left the set in a huff when he learned that the film wasn't about a police officer. However, it's clear that the main character's mental decline and loss of job and family after chasing a UFO in his car is heavily based on Dale Spa's case. Eventually, Spa's life would improve again. He did some TV interviews, likely based around close encounters of the third kind. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any of these. During one of these appearances on Good Morning America, Dale's son saw him, called the station, and managed to get in touch and reunite with their dad. There's not a lot of info out there about Dale's later years, but by all accounts, his life eventually got better. After reuniting with his children, he moved back to Ohio, opened a bar, and spent the final years of his life regaling his patrons with stories of how he once saw a UFO named Floyd, who, he said, still occasionally visited him. Dale passed away on April 4th, 1983. Hector Quintanilla would later write a book about his time at Blue Book that was highly critical of Hynek in particular, and details the frustrations and stress of his job. In his last interview, he still vehemently denies there was ever a cover-up. For the remainder of his life, he'd be accused of orchestrating a conspiracy, when, in reality, if there was a conspiracy, he was a tool of it, not the mastermind. Willfully ignorant and complicit, perhaps, but he wasn't technically covering things up. In a way, Quintanella would end up in a position somewhat like Spa. He told people the truth, and they didn't believe him. Whew. And that's it. If you're still watching at this point, I'd like to say thank you for your attention and your time. If you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing, and I have a Patreon. I'd like some patrons, so if you like this and you like my other stuff and you'd like me to make more, please consider it. The whole point of this video wasn't to prove anything and more to just kind of demonstrate the human toll that these stories have on witnesses, and I think Dale Spar is probably the best example, or the worst example, of what Project Blue Book did to people. And it's a shame that he's still not around to kind of give his side of the story, because I think times have changed slightly. But not entirely. We're more likely to embrace credible people who say these sorts of things, but also, there's still that pushback from some mainstream scientists who purport to be open-minded and critical, but instantly take a position on something and ignore anything that points to the contrary. In 1966 and 1967 there was Carl Sagan, and in 2021 there's Neil deGrasse Tyson. I don't mean to criticise any of them, just pointing out we need more people like J. Allen Hynek. And that's it, thanks again, until next time.
There I stood in the driveway with a handful of greasy pancakes and my mouth open, wondering what the heck I'd saw. <laughs> <laughs>